Hey, today it's Prezo, and welcome back to my workshop. Now this is episode five of building a diesel fuel burner for your home foundry. Now in the last episode I was working on a service cart for the foundry. This has the blower, the fuel tank, the fuel pump, just sitting in the bottom of the tank at the moment, and this control box on top here, and the whole thing is mobile, so you can take it outside your workshop, use it outside, and then put it away again at the end of the day. Now, I tried this out, I melted some aluminium with it in the furnace and it worked perfectly. And now that I know that it does work well, I can finish off a few details on this service cart. Now the first one we're going to look at is mounting the fuel pump in a more permanent way inside the tank. Now at the moment it's just sort of rattling around inside the bottom of the tank. And I also want to be able to close off the tank with the original cap so that we don't get dirt and debris and insects in with the fuel. And that means mounting the pump uh, in a more permanent fashion alongside the original opening to the tank. I also want to powder coat this control box and make a nice neat uh, panel to go on top here. We'll do that in the laser cutter engraver and get that part of it finished off. And we might even make a casting at the end of the video. But first job, just got to work on this fuel pump. So let's get it out and have a look. So here's our fuel pump. I've taken this out of the tank and I've just wiped all the excess fuel from it. Now this is actually a fuel pump from a Yamaha motorcycle. Now I'll put a link in the description below. I bought this on eBay and it was relatively inexpensive and it seems to be sized about right for the two and a half gallon per hour nozzle that I'm using in my burner. Now it's operated by 12 volts DC and I've got a variable DC power supply in my control box. This Molex connector allows me to remove the whole pump assembly from the control box and the service cart for cleaning comes with its own filter which goes in the tank but I also fitted an inline filter as well. Today's challenge is to mount this rigidly inside the tank instead of just letting it flop around in the bottom. Now to do that I'm going to use this uh, copper conduit here. Now this is just a piece of copper tube 19 millimeters OD and that's the correct size to take the fuel tubing plus the two wires. They'll fit up inside that tube. Bit of a snug fit but it does go. And at the top of the tank, I'm going to use these brass fittings here. Now, these are just plumbing fittings I had lying around. So the copper tube will fit into this board hex fitting here. That will be soldered in place. The flange will be bolted to the top of the tank. And then the fuel tube and the wiring will come out through this hole here. Now, the challenge is at the other end, we need to connect the fuel pump to this copper conduit. Now, I've got some Delrin and this will make a clamp that goes around the outside of the pump body. Now I've checked and Delrin is diesel fuel compatible. In fact a lot of fuel pump manufacturers use Delrin in their pumps. So we can slice off a chunk of that board out to fit over the outside of the pump body. But then how do we connect the copper tube to the piece of Delrin clamp to the pump body? Now I've got to leave room here so we can tighten up the fuel clamp or the hose clamp and we've got to leave room for the two spade connectors that take the power to the pump. So there sort of needs to be a gap there and I'm going to try to figure out some sort of like an external rod connector to join the copper tube to our Delrin. Just before we jump over to the lathe to start the machining I wanted you to see where I'm at with the design which means making it up in my head as we go along and I've been able to get the fuel tube and the wiring up through the copper tube there and that's about as close as I want to get between the end of the pump body and the copper tube and that's so I can do up the hose clamp and get it tight. Now in order to connect the two uh, what I've got is this nasty bit of brass here. This is just an old failed brass casting. It'll get machined to fit over the end of the copper tube. The Delrin will get machined to fit over the black section which is made of plastic and to connect the two I'm going to use a piece of brass strip. So it will fit into some machine slots and it'll be screwed together. And uh, as it is at the moment, that's a fairly rigid connection as it is, but I'd rather have a solid connection between the two rather than just relying on the flex in the wiring and the tubing. Anyway, let's get over the lathe and start machining.
you can see that piece of brass is not the best stock in the world. <laughs> uh, it's going to get soldered onto the copper tube. So it's really just an attachment point for a brass strap that will go on the side there. Uh, it would be nice to have some brand new brass stock, but I think this will be fine. I need to go ahead and drill an offset bore in this Delrin part here and that will take the housing on the end of the fuel pump body and then eventually these two bores between the brass part and the Delrin part will be aligned and they will sort of match up with uh, one part of the circumference in the same plane. Uh, you'll see how that works shortly. So I've got the setup in the four jaw now. I need to make a 25mm bore and it needs to be offset 4mm from the centre of this Delrin part. So if I sweep the part through 180 degrees, we should get a total of 8 millimeters, and that's our 4 millimeter offset. And then after we finish boring that 25 mil hole, the end of the fuel pump body should slide in. It'll be held in place with a single grub screw. It's just to stop the fuel pump from flapping around inside the tank, so it doesn't need to be super tight. Alright, <laughs> that was lucky. So what I'll do now is just put some chamfers on that. This part can come out, we'll go over the mill and we'll cut the slot for the brass strip. Well there's the pocket now with the brass strip in it. I think I'm just going to soft solder this together. It doesn't need to be that strong. I'll put an assembly hole in this ring part uh, now and put a thread in it so I can use a brass screw to hold everything together while I do the soldering. That's a 6BA thread. I'll just pop a number 33 hole in a piece of brass strip here to align with that, and that'll hold that all together temporarily.
Okay, so I can put a screw in there, but I need to get the Delrin part done with the same style of pocket. Uh, but it could be a problem. All right, the problem is that uh, old dumbass here forgot to put a reference mark on this part while it was still in the four jaw chuck. So if I put a scribe line from say the three o'clock position to the nine o'clock position, I could position that mark parallel to the vice jaws or level with the vice jaws, and that would position it in the vise with the thickest part right at the very top, and I could machine the pocket. So I thought about it, and there's, there's probably ways of doing it, but I've only got a little brain. So what I came up with was this laser cut alignment jig. So this is made of two parts. The inner section fits in the bore, and the outer section has a scribed line from that three o'clock position across the nine o'clock position. So all we need to do is to put the alignment jig in the bore and just rotate the jig and sort of feel when it's aligned correctly. It's going to be close enough. And now I can put my scribe mark across the vice jaws. So I'll leave it in position while I machine the pocket. Won't matter, it's a one off thing. That's it there. So now I can center find the part and I can go ahead and machine the pocket. Okay, I've centered up there now, so I'll cut the pocket uh, the same width as our brass strip and then we get that assembled. I'll also drill three holes. Now, just off camera, I cut that brass strip to length and I put three holes in there. They're clearance holes for a 6BA screw and two of them will be used to attach the brass strip. The middle one will be used as sort of a grub screw to hold the assembly onto the fuel pump. I'll finish tapping those holes off camera and then we'll do the assembly. Well there's the full assembly, I just did this off camera. That middle screw that you can see protruding there is longer than the other two and it's pressed up against the plastic housing at the top of the fuel pump. Now not by very much, it's just barely gripping so I'm not going to deform anything but that makes it a really rigid tight assembly now so I'm really happy with that. The outlet from the fuel pump is concentric with the copper tube so when we attach the fuel tube it doesn't have a kink or bend and the wiring will fit alongside the fuel tube at a later stage. Now I'm not going to solder this joint here, that one screw is enough, but I will solder that brass ring to the copper tube here. So what we can do now is turn our attention to this end and we'll get all the fittings on that and we can bolt everything into the fuel tank. I was just getting ready to mount this conduit in the fuel tank and in the previous episode I said I was going to cut a hole alongside this existing filler neck here and I was going to mount this brass flange in the top of the tank or underneath the top surface of the tank there. The conduit would fit down through that and then I'd have the pump rigidly mounted in the tank but I still had access to this filler so I could fill the, the tank with fuel. Now one of the things about publishing these videos in parts is that often people leave comments on the previous video and often they're brilliant ideas that you just totally overlook yourself. Now one person commented and said why would you bother cutting another hole in the tank when you could fit that conduit down through this hole and then you can still take the pump out, you can fill the tank 
And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so what I've done is I've cut a hole in this black plastic cap here, and this will take the copper conduit down to the bottom of the tank. And it does mean that you can just simply unwind the cap, take the whole pump assembly out and fill the tank. But wait, there's more. Um, I'm going to turn this over. I'm going to show you something I've discovered on the inside of this cap. Now, did you know that there's a perfectly good three quarter pipe thread on the inside of that cap there? Did you know that? I didn't know that. Well, what it means is that you can put a brass fitting like that in that threaded section there. And then you've got something metal that you can attach your conduit to. So that was a bit of a bonus. Uh, and what it means now is that I can fit the copper tube up through a fitting like this, but I'm not gonna use this one. I'll show you what I've got. What I've done is I've machined up a slightly longer section of that threaded coupling there, and I bored this out so it's a sliding fit on the copper tube rather than a tight fit. And what I can do now is screw that into the cap, and then we can fit our conduit through here, and it will just slide and rotate and that means that when you go to remove the cap, you don't have to worry about the pump twisting and the tubing twisting and the wiring twisting. It will just rotate, but everything inside will simply stay in place. I'll show you what I mean. Well, there's a full assembly now. I've got the fuel tube and the wiring running down the inside of the conduit and I've clamped the fuel tube onto the pump. Everything's fastened at this end. I've cleaned everything up. So to assemble this now, it's just a piece of cake. You just drop the filter in lower the whole assembly to the bottom of the tank and you can sort of feel when the filters are lined with the uh, recess at the bottom of the tank there and then you just tighten up the cap. So uh, I reckon that's a brilliant solution. I just wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> just about to powder coat this box here. Uh, this is for all the controls on the service cart and when I got this piece of material it was scratched and dented and heavily damaged. I sanded that all over with a 220 grit random orbit sanding pad and you can still see some of the damage, but the powder that I'll be using to do this is called Wrinkle Black. Now this is a Caswell powder, and it's excellent for this sort of job here because it will hide all of those defects. And the finish that you get is a bit like what you would see on old vintage radio and electronic equipment. So I think it's going to be great for this. So I'll get the powder on and bake it, and I'll show you when I'm done. Okay, we'll leave that for about five minutes. The powder will start to fuse and form a shiny coating. Then the texture develops and then you leave it another 10 minutes and it's fully cured. You can see the shine on that uh, powder coat now, but the texture is developing right at the back where it was hotter. So that'll come forward and then we'll get this beautiful wrinkly finish and it's all gonna be done. Okay, well there's our fully finished part. As you can see, it's got that beautiful texture on it. I'll let this cool down now, and that's been like 25 minutes from bare metal part to a fully finished part. And after this is cooled, you don't need to do anything else to it. It's super durable and ready to go. So for me, powder coating is the best way to finish metal parts in the workshop. Okay, let's let it cool. Well, there's a really good look at the powder coat finish on that part now, and it's a really good match for the 3D printed parts that I've got here as well. So this is PETG filament, and it was done on a Prusa printer, and the print bed texture matches really well with that wrinkle finish. And the other thing I want to do now is go ahead and finish off the fascia panel for the control box. Now, I did this one as a rough mock-up just to check the position of all of the cutouts and the text, and it's not quite right, needs a bit of tweaking but I was just cleaning it to show you on camera and I sort of bent it and it cracked. So yeah, definitely gonna make another one of those. And uh, oh, and I wanna show you my knob too.
Well, there's the finished plate. I've cleaned it up around the edges to get rid of any scorch marks. And you're probably wondering what this big black circle is in the center here. That space is reserved for branding, and I'll show you that at the end. Well, as you can see, the fascia panel is now installed. I've rewired all of the interior of this box and everything works. Now, some people were concerned that I had heat sinks inside this box and it's closed off at both ends. And they suggested that maybe it was going to overheat in hot weather. So I've taken that advice on board and what I'll do is I'll fit this little uh, vent plate here. So I'll need to reprint these two ends. So that will go on one end and I've ordered a 40 millimeter silent PC fan, 12 volt, to go in this end here. So that will just sort of circulate some air through the box there. Now, I bet you're dying to see my knob. And there it is, and isn't it magnificent? Now there is actually two of these. These were machined up out of some scrap aluminium. They've been anodized, so we've got blue for air, red for fuel. And they have a pointer, which makes it really easy to see what setting you dialed in on both the controls. So if you're standing back from a distance, you can just look over and you see what settings you've got. Now these switches have been replaced. They're brand new ones with red neons. And I want to show you now some of the upgrades that have happened because of comments that were made on the previous video. So the first one here is the cooling fan that I fitted in this end of the control box. And the fan is actually on the inside and I've got some steel gauze or steel mesh there. So we're not going to get insects and so on on the inside of the box. So I did have to 3D print a new end for it, but I think this is a big improvement. Wait till I turn around and I'll show you the other side. Well, there's the vent that I showed you earlier, but it's been powder coated and it's been screwed onto a new 3D printed end for the box. There is some steel gauze on the inside there, again, to stop insects from getting in. And this is actually where the hot air will escape. So the fan blows the air right through the box and it exits through this uh, little louver here. Okay, let's look at another feature. Now, another viewer had suggested it probably wasn't a good idea to have this rubber tube exposed where it joins onto the burner. And when this is stretched out straight and you're walking past with a crucible full of red hot metal, if you have a spill, you could potentially burn through that tube, then you get a fuel leak, and then you're going to have a bad day. So what I've done is I've put a stainless steel sleeve over all of that tubing up to the fuel filter. This little section here is really close to the tank anyway, so it should be fine. And you can buy this stuff on eBay. It's like an expanding stainless steel sleeve. When you slide it on the tube and stretch it out straight, it shrinks down onto the tube. Now, all of the ideas I've showed you just now are ones that have come from comments on the previous videos, all brilliant ideas, and you know, I try to adopt as many as I can if I haven't gone too far with the build. Now, another comment was that I shouldn't be using a plastic fuel tank for the same reason. If you have a spill, you could puncture the tank. Now, I'm sort of stuck with this now because it fits the cart, but what I can do in future is make a steel cover just to cover the top and the front. And that way, if you get a spill, you get, uh, you know, some protection to the tank itself. All right, now, we talked about this too much. It's time to actually get on and use this. So I'm going to make some castings, and then I'll show you the castings when we're done. And we'll talk about the project that they're going to be used for.
did actually get the shutdown procedure for this furnace sorted. So what I do now is when I want to check the temperature of the melt, I turn the fuel down to about 20%. I can open the lid, you can scoop out the dross, you can also check the temperature of the melt without burning up your pyrometer. And then when I want to take the crucible out, I'll turn the fuel off at the plug valve on the burner. Now that cuts the fuel immediately. I'll turn the fuel pump off electrically as well but I don't have that problem with the residual flame that keeps burning after you take the crucible out. A little bit of smoke still coming out of there, but I think that's just part and parcel of using diesel as a fuel source. But overall, super happy with the way that went today. It was about 15 minutes from start to finish to putting the metal in to actually pouring it. And I used a brand new ingot of 601 series alloy for doing this casting. So let's go and check, see how they came out. So here are the finished castings. I think they turned out great. And these are gonna feature in a playlist that should be airing in about a week or two. So we're gonna be doing some metal machining, some metal finishing, and we're gonna make a useful tool for your drill press in your workshop. So tune in for that, but for now, I think it's time to do the wind up. Well, that's it guys. I think I'm gonna sign off on this build now. I'm totally happy with it. I think it hits all the criteria that I set back in episode one, apart maybe from the noise. It's marginally noisier than my old propane burner, but I'm happy to trade that off against the speed of being able to melt materials much more quickly. Yeah, I think it's also cheap to operate and it's simple and easy, and being on this cart here means that I can move it around the workshop. So maybe the only improvement would be to sort of work out some sort of a bracket or some sort of a, a clip or clamp for the burner itself, rather than just balancing it on the tank. But yeah, yeah, totally happy. Thanks for watching, thanks for tuning in, and we've got a new project starting in the next video. So, uh, oh, you want to see what's under there? Really? Okay, because you asked nicely. Well, that's my little tribute to my mentor on this project, and that's Perry Merritt. You know him as SW Dweeb, and without his guidance and input, I don't think this project would have happened. So, thanks very much, Perry, and we both own a diesel burner now.